Today on Landline, living with Varroa mite. There's lessons for businesses, there's lessons for government, uh, for researchers, and also for individual beekeepers to realise that, you know, they are really critical to the movement of this pest and disease, of any pest and disease. Lumpy skin disease isn't in Australia, but it's disrupting our cattle trade with Indonesia with blemished livestock being rejected. They stay on property. Essentially, there isn't a secondary market for them. If we, if we grow them out to a heavier weight, we might be able to access Vietnam, we might be able to access Malaysia, but, but these aren't major markets for the Northern Territory. Indonesia's the main game. The big investment in Australian grown and made microwave popcorn. And this was always about the fact that we thought that the product was just so good that it was worthwhile going to the trouble of creating a manufacturing facility. The primary part of this product is good quality popping corn. Hello, I'm Pip Courtney. After the destruction of more than 30,000 beehives, the Varroa mite eradication strategy in New South Wales has been abandoned. Now the honeybee industry wants exit packages to help those not up to the rigorous requirements needed to cope with the deadly pest. Lismore-based Bronwyn Herbert with this story about living with Varroa mite. block near Orange in central west New South Wales, John Lockwood cracks open his hives. His bees make their way to the neighbouring gums while he takes stock on what's been his toughest test in 20 years in the bee business. Your bees are part of the family. You spend every living moment looking after them, thinking about where they're going to go next. What do they need? Do they need a feed? Uh, do they need shifting? Um, and to simply have to go over there and, and kill them, um, yeah, it was a very hard thing to do. The beekeeper had two and a half thousand hives pollinating an almond farm in the Riverina region when he found out Varroa was on a neighbouring property. Varroa mite wasn't uh, detected in our hives, but because they were entrapped in the eradication zone, zero to three kilometres on the orchard, they had to be euthanised. His hives were some of the last killed under the eradication program and because of the sheer scale of his operation, he was pouring petrol on his own bees. Because it was such a large amount of bees, the DBI uh, didn't have the manpower to come in and, and euthanise the hives themselves. Uh, my almond orchard needed to spray insecticides, so we had to send a, a crew of our own team over there to, to euthanise the beehives. And yeah, that's one of the hardest things I've ever had to do. Derek Seems bees were also doomed. The third generation beekeeper spent a decade building up his hive numbers to make it a viable operation. To try and grow through the fires, the floods, the droughts, and to finally build up to a, um, a, a good enough number to call it a, a commercial sized business um, and looking to reap the rewards in the coming years. So yeah, we, we really did throw all our eggs in, in that basket. His hives had tested negative to Varroa and in August, Derek Seam trucked his 1,000 hives, 1,000 kilometres from his home in Kempsey to almond orchards in the Riverina. Ten days after they arrived on the almonds, we found out there was a, a varroa mite incursion in our town uh, where the bees had come from. And um, from there it was um, maybe another ten days um, and they were all euthanised. So, um, really tough to, to hear um, that information at the time and, um, yeah, really, really tough. Effectively, a whole livelihood was wiped out with that one phone call? Yes, absolutely, yeah. Um, I had no idea of the, the scale that it would have um, ended 
that way and um, yeah, it's just devastating for our family and um, I work closely with my, my dad and my brother and um, it, we're all in the same area, the same situation and we're all wiped out, unfortunately. Um, you know, overnight we were beekeepers and then we weren't. Varroa mite was first detected in sentinel hives at the port of Newcastle, but authorities now know Ground Zero was near Williamtown, further north. Despite efforts to eradicate, the mite was on the move. Unfortunately, as it turned out with Newcastle, in which we, are, we know now that we're, it was there at least 12 to 18 months before it became obvious and apparent to um, government and the industry parties that it was there. And then with Kempsey, where it was there at least eight months before um, we were able to bring our, our response to bear, those time delays, that time lag, really is an impediment to an effective eradication response. For Scott Hansen leads the New South Wales Department of Primary Industries and sits on the Vroamite National Management Group, which includes 16 pollination-dependent industries. Honeybees pollinate more than six billion worth of food crops each year. The red dots are just displaying all the infected premises that we've found to date. And it'd be fair to say, as we've gone west and as we've crossed over that Pacific motorway there and gone west, we've found more mites, higher yeah, mite counts. We certainly have. The Kempsey outbreak was the catalyst for the eradication program to be abandoned. It's as we start to get to that tipping point of the number of beekeepers who not only were caught up with the detections, but who realised that they were not going to be able to bring bees back into areas for a, a period of years to ensure that we remained free, that was where we started to lose um, support. And when I say support, that's where we also started to lose confidence about the ability to actually eradicate. New South Wales is home to 45% of Australia's beekeepers, but according to the DPI, there was patchy industry compliance in undertaking varroa testing. We obviously had, you know, at less than half of the um, registered beekeepers undertaking the alcohol washes and the time frame that's required, that's a significant disadvantage to any eradication campaign. Just how varroa mite made its way into Australia is the subject of a federal government-led investigation. Police officers have executed several search warrants after tip-offs that live bees are suspected to have been illegally imported. Beekeepers say compensation has been inadequate and want answers on why the eradication strategy didn't work. We didn't do anything wrong. We've been treated um, not very, very well, <laughs> to be honest. Um, but, um, yeah, it'd be great to find out just how it got here and, and um, the history of it. There's lessons for businesses, there's lessons for government, uh, for researchers and also for individual beekeepers to realise that, you know, they are really critical to the movement of this pest and disease, for any pest and disease. Academic Cooper Shooten has worked with beekeepers in the Pacific who have lived with varroa mite for decades. He's also an amateur beekeeper. There's so, so much that we could be learning from from other countries overseas. They've been managing this pest problem for a long time. It's not the end of the industry. There's lots of beekeepers out there that have got viable businesses and Australia will remain that way as well. Um, what is really clear is that we'll probably see about a 50 to 60% reduction in uh, hobbyists and semi-commercial beekeeping operations. While native stingless bees are safe from varroa attacks, the pest is predicted to sharply reduce the number of feral European honeybees. We'll lose about 95% of the feral bee population and the feral bees are actually supporting a lot of um, horticultural growers in that they provide a free pollination service. Does it spell the end of backyard beehives? It's probably going to get rid of a lot of lazy beekeepers that think that they can just stick a beehive in a paddock and expect it to be healthy, happy and productive. That's just not how beekeeping works these days. But, um, yeah, there's, there's a lot that beekeepers can be doing to try to manage the mite. Keeping a close eye on potential mites is the first step. One non-lethal option is testing using a sugar shake. Shake this around for about 30 seconds. 
So this is a method that we were using in um, Fiji and Papua New Guinea because it's pretty much free. Everyone has access to water and detergent and a jar. We're looking under here and what you're looking for is a tiny little red dot the size of a sesame seed. It's actually one of the largest ectoparasitic mites in the world relative to their host. So for you and I, it'd be like having a dinner plate sized tick on your back, which is not a lot of fun. But that'd be very uh, easy to see in there if, you, if they were in that colony. Alcohol or soap wash are both considered reliable and sensitive measures. Doing the, the soap wash or the alcohol wash for about 30 seconds is probably the best way uh, to retrieve the most amount of mites. Now that's all pretty clear to me. Miticide strips containing a chemical lethal to the mite are now available to varroa affected beekeepers. Yeah, so you'd be putting these in here if you were reaching that threshold of, of about 5% uh, mite infestation. Commercial suppliers are now permitted to import and sell select varroa treatments. Also really important that we take these strips out after six to eight weeks because otherwise you've got mites in there that have been exposed to a little bit of chemical but not enough to kill them and that's what causes resistance issues. At Goldfields Honey headquarters near Orange, the industry pain hasn't yet flowed into disrupting honey extraction and production but John Lockwood is well aware of the major challenges ahead. We've got to think about our whole business model again. Uh, we're going to have to increase staff levels to deal with the actual mite and do um, monitoring for the mite. Uh, we're going to have to investigate uh, locations where we keep the bees for winter to try and slow down the, the breeding of the mite. And we're going to have to sacrifice honey flows to also treat the mite and keep on top of it. Um, and we're also looking at um, mechanical uh, measures such as this screen bottom board. And it all costs more money. It all costs money, uh, it's all adding up and it's, it's um, on the brink of being unviable really. But we either get stuck into it and have a go or we give up now. Experts predict varroa mite will spread across all Australian states, except WA and Tasmania, within three years. Beekeepers need to make a decision very quickly. While their beehives are still healthy and they're not um, riddled with varroa, they need to decide whether they're in or they're out and whether they can afford to keep going with varroa in their businesses. If they learn the hard way, then the varroa will uh, breed into massive numbers and we'll have what we call mite bombs and they'll be infecting the other beekeepers that are going to keep continuing. So a strategy needs to be developed for those beekeepers to exit the industry while they still have something to sell. But for those who can rebuild hives and learn to live with the pest, there could be new opportunities. Growers are going to need more bees on crops um, and some of the growers that are out there that are not paying for services that are getting free pollination will then have to start getting pollination services. Um, that's going to really increase the demand at a time when beekeepers are finding it even harder to keep their bees alive. Coming up on Landline, want to back Australian grain growers? Well, it's as easy as microwaving popcorn. We often talk about supporting Australian farmers, but what most likely comes to mind when you hear that is meat or dairy, fruit or vegetables. But in the snack or convenience food category, there are also plenty of homegrown options. And places like this are proof of that. Hi, I'm Kath Sullivan. In Victoria, more than 1,400 dairy workers have been striking for a better pay deal. The industrial action includes factory workers from milk suppliers Saputo, Fonterra and Lactalis, along with ice cream manufacturer Peters. The walkout coincided with a 48-hour strike by milk truck drivers and caused some dairy farmers to pour thousands of litres of milk down the drain. Workers picketing at the Peters factory in Melbourne say they deserve a better share of the company's recent success. And we just want a, a reasonable share of the extra gains that this company are making. 
the Australian government will commit an additional $268 million towards eradicating fire ants. The funding, to be committed in the budget update later this year, will expand the fire ant program, providing an additional 350 workers, a new depot, vehicles, aerial eradication contracts and an extra 1,400 tonnes of bait each year. Well, for almost seven years, Fiona Simpson has led Australia's farm lobby. Through record-breaking droughts, fires, floods, she's seen market highs and lows, trade bans, increased biosecurity threats and a pandemic that brought large parts of the country to a halt. As she prepares to step down from the NFF, I asked Fiona Simpson to reflect on the state of Australian farming today. There is so much positivity about our sector. There's so much positivity about the people in our sector and some of the changes that we've seen in our sector over the last decade. But there's also, of course, a lot of challenges and, and uncertainty, not just in terms of the weather, which is coming back again right now, but also, I guess, in terms of some of the policies that we're discussing in Australia right now about the sustainability of our sector, about how we go forward in a lower carbon economy. Uh, and what actually, you know, what is the balance of farming? How do we actually, you know, I think, mix farming with everything else that has to be done and make sure that growing food and fibre is at the heart of some of these big discussions that we're having in Australia right now. Of course, it was your leadership at the NFF that set the target to become a $100 billion industry by 2030. That's had support from both sides of politics. Are you confident that the industry can get there? Look, there's, um, there's so many um, tailwinds at the moment around that goal. And it's really exciting to see that that headline captured so much imagination, not just, of course, the government, but also the communities and the stakeholders in our sector. And it's not just about that, that headline, of course, it's also about the things underneath it. It's about some of the, the people in our industry, it's about the infrastructure, it's about our communities. And so I think there'll be some challenges, definitely some challenges, not just in achieving perhaps that amount, but also seeing the outcomes that um, that, that figure actually represents. Perhaps when you set that target, you didn't think interest rates would be so high or it would be so hard to find workers um, right across Australia. Nobody could foresee the pandemic. What do you see as the greatest challenges um, for the farm industry over the past decade or so? Well, I think definitely this discussion around sustainability. Australian agriculture is a very different industry to a lot of the industries in the Northern Hemisphere. You know, we have different production systems. We have uh, different things in place. We have things that are applicable to Australian production systems. So actually being able to sell that message uh, not just to the Northern Hemisphere, but also to our consumers here in Australia. And that's something that we've absolutely concentrated on, is how we keep making those connections so that Australians realise and are champions for our amazing agricultural industry in Australia. Do you think that relationship has changed over um, the past seven years, the way that farmers communicate with their consumers? Look, certainly I do. And we've actually invested A, money, but B, a lot of effort in making sure that we can connect with consumers. Uh, I think it's something that's widely recognised that agriculture took its foot off the pedal when we were talking to consumers. We let some of the, the greenwashing that was going on you know, a decade or more ago take precedent. Whereas now we have a huge focus on, on telling the story of farmers, telling the story of farming, telling the story of our amazing industry and all the stakeholders and supply chain that's part of it. And I think it's when you look at some of the figures that are coming out now around the research that we've done and others about what people know about farmers, what people feel about agriculture, you can see it starting to Pay, pay dividends. Yet as you depart this role, uh, it's a time when the government is phasing out an industry, the live sheep exports. We know the government is going to ban that. We know that the government wants to be able to buy more water, take more water away from irrigation to help the environment in the Murray-Darling Basin. Do you feel like perhaps you haven't done as much work there as you could have? Certainly there are lots of jobs for the next president to do. Um, and, the, and not just the president, the whole organisation to do. And it's really concerning, I think, that policy decisions are being made um, in a vacuum of credible science and facts. Uh, in Australia, we are an open market economy, a market-based economy. We must make policy decisions with the rigour of credible science and facts and data. So it's incredibly concerning to see decisions that are made uh, really purely on one ground alone and on the basis of election commitments that could have been made some time ago. You came into the national spotlight, into into Canberra from the Liverpool Plains where you farm with your family. You had a history of campaigning against the coal seam gas industry um, with New South Wales farmers. Has Canberra surprised you? 
Um, sometimes it's just what goes round comes round again and I think it's eternally frustrating. We've been talking recently about renewable energy which farmers by and large are hugely on board with um, but right now we're seeing you know the companies that are building some of those installations and transmission lines um, trampling all over the rights of farmers and landholders. So really you know I think Canberra to me is, is a bigger is just a bigger pond really isn't it but we need to keep learning from the past we need to we, we shouldn't be reinventing the wheel when it comes to best practice. Um, we need to actually keep moving forward rather than going back. Have you got any interest in joining the politicians? <laughs> no, uh, one thing that has certainly stuck out for me is that that's not a job for me. Won't be contesting the New England election, <laughs> for example. I think I've, I've made things, but talked about knitting needles and things before, so no, next election in New England is not for me. You've been in the position through droughts, floods, fires, pandemic, Conservative government, Labor government, are there some conditions that make the job a little bit easier? I think when you start building consensus and, and build relationships with people where you feel that people are understanding what you're actually saying, where you can get people on ground, where they can see you know, farmers and meet with farmers and talk to farmers, where you really feel that you're making having an outcome, even though you don't always win. Those are the things, I think. And when you talk to farmers out on the ground who actually are expressing their thanks for what you do, those are the things that are really rewarding uh, for the job that I do. And what's next for you? Well, a little bit, little bit of time off, to be honest. It's been a bit of a hectic, wild ride. But I really love my other jobs. I love the, my role at ACR. Uh, I also ch sit on another couple of boards as well. And uh, I'll be a bit, taking a bit of time off with my family and my husband in particular, who might get a bit sick of me around the house. But you can't sit still for long. <laughs> Look, uh, a little bit of travel, personal travels, probably on the horizon. And of course, I've got three gorgeous grandchildren and another one on the way. So I'm very much looking forward to, to that as well. Fiona Simpson, one last time as National President of the Farmers Federation, thanks for joining me online. Always an absolute pleasure. Thanks, Kath. Australia has never had a case of lumpy skin disease, yet it's causing major disruption to our cattle trade with Indonesia. Exporters say up to 40% of cattle from northern stations are being rejected because of skin marks. The fallout for the industry could be massive. Landline's Christy O'Brien reports on a year northern beef producers would rather forget. Just when the northern cattle industry thought it could breathe again. A massive spanner in the works. It's been a proper shit year, to be honest. It's, um, Indo's never really got fired, fired up. Um, yeah, it's been hard and then this turned up and you now the prices are going down. So there's people that have been sitting on a lot of cattle and, and now we'll have to keep sitting on them for the foreseeable future. New rules have caused massive disruption, leaving thousands of cattle on properties and in yards with no viable market. The Northern Territory Cattlemen's Association fears it could just be the beginning. At the moment, we're looking at very hard protocols, very hard processing. Anything that has skin marks is not getting onto a vessel. It's been a year the $900 million industry would probably like to forget. LSD was first detected in Indonesia last March. The disease is transmitted by insects and is highly infectious amongst cattle and buffalo. It can reduce milk production and appetite and even kill an animal, but it poses no threat to human health. Australia has never had any cases, but in July, Indonesia suspended imports from four Australian export facilities following the detection of the virus in livestock shipped from Australia. Malaysia also suspended all Australian cattle imports. During high-level talks, the Prime Minister raised the matter with Indonesian President Joko Widodo. The ban was lifted in September, but only with Australia agreeing to extra biosecurity measures. We've also agreed to make sure that we're performing visual inspections of cattle before they depart Australia. And it's under these measures that the Department of Agriculture is enforcing the new rules. Hamish Brett comes to it wearing several hats. A vet for many decades, he's also a producer and export yard owner. 
At the Kamali Yards, south of Darwin, where cattle are spilled before being shipped out, he's just inspected livestock for a ship headed to Indonesia in 24 hours. So Hamish, the cattle here, are any of these likely to be candidates for ejection? Yep, there's a number of them, Christy. See one there with his, see that bit of mark on his neck? neck? Yep. yep. Probably over here, this one over here. On the eye? Yep, and below on his neck as well. Any cut, ringworm, bite or raised lumps on the skin are being questioned. All are commonplace in the top end, especially in the wet season when insects multiply. You see a lot of old cows and stuff like that, fly bites all over their neck, both sides, fair enough, pull them out and, and most of them don't go anyway, no. we always pull them out, yeah, but yeah. these little fellas that, yeah, that have got, you've got to get a magnifying glass to bloody look Actually at them. Actually look at it, yeah. The Department of Agriculture maintains only cattle with skin lesions consistent with clinical signs of infectious or contagious diseases are affected. But some exporters have reported as many as 40% of cattle supplied by stations are being rejected by regional vets. To be honest, it depends on the day mm. of who, which... Who's on. Who's on, which RVO's on, as to how hard they go. Um, That's incredibly inconsistent. It, yeah, it's very inconsistent. Hamish says the new rules remind him of the 2011 export suspension. He has his own cattle sitting in yards, so understands firsthand what anxious producers are going through. Well, I've already got two pens down the bottom with bad skin, cattle. skin lesions and that that we've been pulling out as well. So, so what are your options then? Bugger all. The big problem is what to do with rejected livestock. With beef prices plunging, sending them to southern markets isn't viable. I think we're seeing livestock prices across the country at the moment heading in one direction. So for us, ensuring that we're able to access our most efficient market and our closest market and our most commercially viable market is critical. I mean, these cattle going east be become very expensive very quickly. And international markets are also unavailable. They stay on property. Essentially, there isn't a secondary market for them. If we, if we grow them out to a heavier weight, we might be able to access Vietnam. Yeah, we might be able to access Malaysia, but, but these aren't major markets for the Northern Territory. Indonesia's the main game. Further down the track, keeping these stock in the herd can impact genetics as well. The likes of myself and most other producers, like we, like our heifers, if, if they've got fly bite on them or they've got a bit of that on them, I, I cull them to Indonesia because I don't want it through my herd. So now we're gonna see all those heifers we can't do anything with them, so they'll go out and they'll get pregnant and they'll stay in the herd. So we're just exacerbating the problem throughout the whole industry. Producers and exporters are worried the impact yeah. of the regulations are indicative of diplomatic fractures with Indonesia. Our government needs to do a bit more with the Indonesian government. I think that's where it's lacking and I think that's where this whole lumpy skin thing came about. They were given the opportunity Apparently it was three weeks before the industry knew there was a problem and they just sat on it, our government sat on it and then all of a sudden it's caused a bloody big shitstorm. I think that it, what it does show is that we can't take for granted the trading relationships we have with other countries. They always need to be worked on. The Minister for Agriculture is adamant the rules are not a trade barrier. We don't see it that way. I mean, every country in the world has strong biosecurity requirements. We certainly do uh, when it comes to allowing imports of uh, food uh, and agricultural products from other countries. He says DAF is well within its rights to enforce such protocols and doesn't believe it poses any conflict. I think that that's a valid arrangement for DAF to play. As the, as the Federal Department of Agriculture, you would expect that they would be leading those negotiations with other countries about their biosecurity requirements. But of course, they're the, they're the group who are best placed to be dealing with local industry as well. A delegation from Indonesia is visiting Australia this month to inspect the facilities that were recently suspended. It's hoped they will also be able to learn more about northern cattle conditions so that they can see firsthand the very strong biosecurity practices that we have here in Australia on farms, in abattoirs, on the transport routes and when it comes to the ports as well for live cattle exports. So I'm very hopeful that uh, this will only assist to build confidence in Indonesia in the strength of our biosecurity protections and that will give them the confidence to keep bringing in exports of live cattle here from Australia for a long time to come. So for us, as we come into the wet season, we are looking to try and work with the Australian government and the Indonesian government 
to increase that level of awareness and understanding about the ecosystems where we produce cattle. And we're hoping to see uh, a positive outcome to this. Because for us, I mean, we're having consignments, and, uh, especially when we're protocoling on property, we might be taking out 30% of our saleable cattle. Broad surveillance of local cattle for LSD is ongoing. And the government says it's been proactive through vaccine rollout. Last week, it signed a new contract with MSD Animal Health for the supply of 300,000 doses of LSD vaccine for Australia, Timor-Leste and PNG to shore up greater biosecurity protection for Australian cattle. The overriding fear on everyone's mind is if LSD was declared in Australia. Cattle exports would immediately halt and access would need to be renegotiated with all of our trading partners. It's estimated the loss in the first year alone from the farm sector would be around $7 billion. But until then, producers are frustrated with having to meet conditions which suggest Australia poses a higher risk than any other beef exporting nation. Australia and Indonesia will review the health requirement within three months. Every producer up here in Northern Australia will have a massive backlog. But it's an anxious wait, with no guarantee the new rules will be removed and the trade flow freely once more. G'day, I'm Matt Brand. There's been a lot of commodities that have dropped in value this year, especially in the livestock sector. And later on, I'll tell you about the low prices that are facing Aussie pear growers. But one industry that is on a high in 2023 is sugar. The global price is up, the Aussie dollar is low, and growers are getting record money for their crop. I spoke to Owen Menkins, who is the chair of Cane Growers, to get a better understanding on what's been driving the sugar price up and up. Yeah, well, there's a, there's a lot of factors. I mean, I guess overall there's a deficit in the world market for sugar. So uh, it's basically due to the fact that India isn't exporting as much as they normally have. And they've just recently put a, a extended the freeze on exports for going forward. So that's uh, produced, uh, increased the prices going forward as well. But overall, there's not as much sugar being produced in India. Thailand's got a, a lower crop and uh, in other parts of of Europe, they've got a lower crop as well. So essentially it's a, it's a deficit and Brazil is the only market that can really take up the deficit. And um, yeah, they've, be, they've produced record amounts of sugar, but it's still not enough to cover the deficit. Owen, can we talk more about India? It's the world's second biggest producer of sugar. Why has it stopped exporting? Uh, yeah, India is has, is not uh, placed a restriction on exports, so as they could uh, lower their uh, domestic prices. And uh, this, because they they're not exporting, that that has meant the world price has gone up. That that, that restriction ended on the thirty first of October, but just recently the Indian government has extended that restriction indefinitely. So that has created uh, that means that they're going to be exporting less sugar next year and the year after, which has put a, a another uh, bounce in the in the market going forward. When we look at the futures price for next year. 2025 and even 2026, these are historically high prices. How much crop are Aussie growers locking in? Yeah, well, I think um, the prices have gone to a level which is unprecedented since the 70s, really. So um, unfortunately, when the price gets fairly high, growers lock it in, but then it kept going. So a lot of growers aren't actually able to, to capture these all of these prices because they've already locked in. But, um, yeah, the 24, 25 and 26 prices are all 
very good. 24 is around 800, 25 is over 700, and 26 is about 670. So um, those prices are all historically high. So, uh, I mean, it's positive news for the industry and positive news for the for the communities that, that survive off the industry too. So there's plenty of incentive to get the crop off this year. How is the harvest going? Yeah, the harvest is going pretty well. We're about uh, over 65% crushed at this stage, uh, which is ahead of where we were last year. And uh, the estimate is is dropping a little bit. That's due to the fact that it's uh, it's pretty dry. And also, we haven't, uh, we had such a late finish last year, that's uh, meant the, um, the, the crop isn't hasn't fully grown out. So uh, we're probably looking under 30 million tonnes for this year for the Queensland crop. And uh, yeah, and that's, and that's a fair bit below last year. But the price is good, so growers want to get everything they can to, to the mill. That's cane grower Owen Menkins. Australia's grain harvest is ramping up. There was barley delivered to one of the Grain Corp sites in Victoria this week. And the latest winter crop forecast from Rabobank is for Australia to produce nearly 49 million tonnes this season, which is down 24% on last year's record crop. Prices remain strong, though, and the demand for grain from feedlotters in the Darling Downs has seen a real premium open up in the north, barley in Queensland fetching more than $100 a tonne compared to areas in the far south and west. In Chicago, wheat futures climbed this week, and at the time of filming, the market was still getting its head around news that a Russian export company had inked a deal to deliver 70 million tonnes of grain to China over 12 years. Some gains in the wool market this week, especially at the finer end, and a clearance rate of over 95%. There'll be a similar offering of wool next week. To the sale yards where numbers lifted, at Roma there was an extra 1,000 head for sale. Agents there said it was noticeable, the lack of buyer interest for cows, bullocks and heavy feeders. The National Heavy Steer Indicator, it fell below $2 a kilo for the first time since early 2015. Abattoirs are busy, more than 130,000 head processed, which is the highest weekly total since May 2020. There weren't as many sheep and lambs yarded this week and prices lifted, except for mutton. It is clear that abattoirs are very much focused on lambs at the moment. The mutton slaughter rate is crashing, lamb slaughter is up, and in Victoria, more than 244,000 lambs processed in one week. That is a state record. And finally, when is the last time you bought a pear? Once a staple, this fruit is losing popularity and it's estimated around 10% of Australia's pear trees have been pulled out of the ground this year. Here's a look at Jake Anderson's family farm in the Goulburn Valley. He says the profit margins for pears have disappeared. Ah, uh, so we've been growing pears since early 1940s. Um, I'm pretty well down to our last block of pears now. Um, over the last five to six years, we've pushed 50% of our orchard out, which was pears. Um, we just can't, we just can't make it work. <laughs> the the profitability is not there. Um, and I guess the selling of it, um, people aren't buying pears like they used to. Mr. Anderson says the cost of labor has become one of his biggest challenges and he's not alone in this decision to get out of pears. The future of Australian pears really depends on our, on our markets um, and people buying it. At the moment, we're seeing mass, mass reductions in, in pears. People are pulling them out left, right and centre because they just purely can't grow them for the, the cost of production. Um, so I don't, I don't know what it holds. There is a lot getting pulled out this year, which hopefully might make might make change, um, but yeah, I, I really don't know. That is the landline check on prices. Keep it rural. Hello, I'm Kerry State. Agricultural education is being put under the microscope at the moment with moves to establish a national strategy that exposes more students to ag and addresses a major teacher shortage. That's next week on Landline. Eating microwave popcorn probably doesn't sound like a way you can support Australian farmers and food producers until now. In Queensland, a multi-million dollar factory has been built to produce 
all Australian microwave popcorn. Landline's Courtney Wilson popped in for this story. Inside this warehouse in Toowoomba on Queensland's Darling Downs, the production line is in full swing. They're churning out a snack food that's hugely popular, although with a new take on an old favourite. We came across this product in Europe and as soon as we saw it, we said, this is really fantastic and it was an easy decision to try to get the licence for it and then manufacture it here in Australia. Like most snacks, a big part of the appeal with popcorn is that it's quick and easy to eat. But producing it is not quite so simple. It actually takes an incredible amount of effort, technology, logistics and know-how. This facility opened in January and cost almost $7 million to set up, with the sole purpose of producing all-Australian pop-it-yourself popcorn. We've got parts of this line that come from Denmark, Germany, Italy, the USA, China. So we've covered quite a bit of the engineering across the world. Setting up a manufacturing business in Australia is no mean feat. The sector has been in sharp decline for decades. But the CEO of Scarecrow Foods, Mark Adamson, believes when you've got the right product, it's worth the gamble. And it all starts with the raw ingredient. The primary part of this product is good quality popping corn. And this was always about the fact that we thought that the product was just so good that it was worthwhile going to the trouble of creating a manufacturing facility. Matthew Barnes is growing popping corn in Emerald in central Queensland. In 2023, that's unusual. There's no doubt cotton is the king of the castle when it comes to economics, but it's just back-to-back -back cotton's a bit hard. And we've planted some popcorn to try and get a rotation in and trying to get something that's got a gross margin that's similar to cotton, I suppose. In the field, popping corn looks a lot like sweet corn. It's probably a little bit softer, it grows a bit quicker. The plant's generally a lot smaller, so it's just not as showy, I suppose. Like all corn, it's got to be managed. The heat affects it massively. This crop was planted in the spring and will be ready for harvest come December. But not before a full-on battle has been waged and hopefully won. The invasive pest fall armyworm, which has a serious sweet spot for corn, has caused havoc here for growers. We've had some pheromone traps here for the whole crop and the first lot of counts was off the scale. So we've had high pressure from day one. Fall armyworm is one of the reasons growers in this area moved away from growing popcorn, including Matthew Barnes. We've had fall armyworm in nearly every other crop, but they just don't seem to affect it. Sorghum, they get into it and they can make it untidy, but they don't do any economic loss. It is just so destructive of corn and it's got a massive love for it. Five years ago, despite being all geared up for growing corn, when the contracts weren't there and with the arrival of the invasive pest, it just didn't seem worthwhile. So much so that Matthew Barnes even sold all the machinery it required. Now he's back here with corn in the ground yet again. Farming is a variable thing. You can never say this is what's going to happen, unfortunately, because that's just not how it works. Our hope here is to make something similar to cotton, if not better than cotton some years. Right now, this is a trial crop. And to grow it, they've been following the latest advice from research led by both government and industry bodies. We've sprayed fairly regularly for the first three to four weeks of the crop, just to try and get that early infestation out. It's probably made the difference between success and failure, I would, would say. Growing it successfully is only half of the battle. They also have to make money at the end of it. Finding the balance between managing the pests and remaining profitable is a work in progress. Some of the insecticides that work really well on it is incredibly expensive. Because this is just a trial area, we haven't done all the things we could have done to make it cheap. We sort of just wanted to prove the concept that we can grow corn again. 
and then we'll make management practices next year to re reduce that cost per hectare. From the farm, the popping corn is then sent to Bean Growers Australia in Kingaroy in Queensland's South Burnett. Here, the raw product, which comes from growers all over the state, is sorted and graded before being distributed. It arrives at the warehouse in Toowoomba in bulk bags. We've got oil and flavouring that we're putting into a batch fat and then we're filling these trays with popcorn, oil and flavour. We're sealing those through a tray sealer machine. Then we're erecting the pop box, gluing the bottom, putting the tray in, folding it down and then putting a band around it before they're packing it off in units of 10 shelf ready cartons. What's left out of this product is almost as important as what's gone into it. This doesn't contain palm oil. And all of the ingredients used are able to be traced back through the supply chain. Almost all, bar some of the oil used, is produced in Australia. And then there's the packaging. The flat pack style cardboard box the popcorn is packed into is one of the main ways it differs to other microwave popcorns. Virtually all of this product is recyclable except for an outer band, which we're working on, um, to try to find a recycling solution for that as well. 15 staff are employed in this facility with a view to increasing that if and when required although machines do a lot of the grunt work. We set this manufacturing line up to be automated end-to-end -end, and we can produce tens of thousands in a day if needed. So, Mark, this is a pretty weird-looking contraption. What is it doing? Uh, this multi-head wire is dispensing the exact no, uh, grammage of popcorn into the trays that we want. If it can't find what it's looking for, It'll top up any light ones, and if it can't, still can't find it, it will dump the whole 14 out, reweigh it to start again, all in a fraction of a second. We often talk about supporting Australian farmers, but what most likely comes to mind when you hear that is buying meat or dairy, fruit or vegetables. But in the snack or convenience food category, there are also plenty of homegrown options. Places like this are proof of that. There's no doubt that things like the cost of manufacturing in Australia has been something that everyone's looked at in isolation over the last 20 years, and a lot of things have been put offshore. But within markets, and I think particularly food manufacturing, I think Australia's still got an opportunity to do that, providing that the product is just strong enough and good enough that the customer base are, are going to support it. The support has certainly been forthcoming when it comes to this popcorn. It was released within Toowoomba and surrounding rural areas at the beginning of the year and mostly stocked in IGAs. But it's also recently been picked up by the major supermarkets. That success means a lot to both the manufacturer and the growers who are making it possible. And it's probably the most rewarding thing that a farmer can do is actually know where his products end up and ends up in the coals and Woolworths. You can see the product in the shelf and say, I probably grew that or there's a chance that I did grow that. Pop it up, self-erecting box, yep. and straight into the microwave. There are now plans to see if there's a broader market for this new take on Australian like microwave popcorn. One of the next steps will be looking at the New Zealand market. Um, and we're exploring some other options globally. That's it, moment of truth. Mark Adamson believes the standard of farming in Australia is what sets us apart from so many other places, and also what makes it worth taking a big gamble on something new. In spite of costs, pests, global Delicious. pandemics, so and the many other hurdles faced along the way. And we were really struggling. Setting up a manufacturing business like this you can do it in Australia because you know that the farmers are really professional and even if it's difficult, they've had a long history of finding a way to make it work. 
Much like the push to get consumers more connected with farmers and the important work they're doing, Mr Adamson believes there is much to be gained from also forging closer connections between farmers and food manufacturers. There really should be a much closer relationship between what that manufacturer needs and if the farmer understands that, then the outcome will most likely be better. And those benefits aren't just for the business people either. It definitely makes farmers think a little bit more about what they're doing instead of just taking it to the local receivable depot and mixing your stuff with everyone else's stuff and not really knowing where it ends up. So it's quite exciting to go through that process. A lot of farmers get something out of that if they do get the opportunity to do it. In my 30 years reporting for Landline, I've seen my fair share of farm sheds. But we recently came across one that's pretty special, owned by farmer Brett Slater. What used to be an old feed shed is now called the library. Can I have a look, Pip? What's it called? Oh, the library. The library. <laughs> Wow, don't see many farm sheds with a chandelier. No, it's very unique. A gift from my sister. Yeah. yeah. I think it's a nice touch. Yeah. Now, this was an old feed shed. What made you want to turn it into the library? Well, we could have parked a tractor in it or something like that, but now we've got it's like several sheds, so this is just somewhere that we can all like socialise after a hard day or, or morning or whatever you want. It's just, yeah, it's just a good place we can all meet. A lot of the memorabilia, um, come from my father and some of the Silverton pub in, the, in Broken Hill, just on driving around, you know, New South Wales. So this library actually has books? Yeah, that, well, we had to have a bookshelf and some books and we sort of, if you came here for the first time or, or um, a repeat offender, you had to bring a book and, but you had to sign it and yeah, you know, and like, you know, put that date in it. And, um, and then if you want to sit back and read or it's just, yeah, you know, like some are a bit, a bit out there, but the man, the myth, the magic. Yeah. <laughs> That's got to be you. Oh, I don't know. I think it's a bit out there, this one, but oh, well, well this is the second book in the library. <laughs> even the, even the, the Sigma. Sigma. <laughs> All right. Here we go. Is that well thumbed? Do many people want to oh, read that? Oh, I don't know about these days. There might be some someone out there, a rare collector, but this is the first book in the library. Ah, uh, in 2020. Yeah. A good book for Hoff and Harry. Who'd want a Sigma? <laughs> oh, no, that's right. There's not many left on the road, but... No. It's, it's oh, that would get some laughs, though. Yeah. Yeah. So what's grabbed your eye in, in this shed, Pip? Oh, well, I do love horses, but this one, what's the story behind this photo? It's amazing. It was another uh, gift from a father, yeah. So it's just an outback ringer, and that's how. It, yeah, it's, I can tell by the cracks on his on his heels and that, that he didn't wear boots, and he just had the spurs, and he's ready to go. Is there something different about this fridge of yours? Yeah, it just it just keeps getting emptied. Yeah, I've got a I've got a son and a few mates that seem to just keep dropping by on every second afternoon and seem to be the more I put in it, the more that comes out of it. <laughs> What's the story with the piano? Do you play? Well, I didn't play, but it was in working order. It 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 sort of come with the property, and it didn't like last year's flood. Ouch. Yeah, so our watermark was just above the keyboard, you know, the, the keys, so it's all swelled and it's just, it's here just to, to rest, your, rest your drink on now. <laughs> yeah. so cowboys and horses are a bit of a theme here. Why is this special? Yeah, it was just a bit of our family history. Um, by, my parents Im, imported this stallion, Snow Fury, from the States uh, in the late 70s and then they had a, an Appaloosa stud and... And they would go around the, the shows, um, yeah, with him, and and obviously the you know the service fees. And it was just as a as a young kid, I can just remember 
like mucking out stables and doing, you know, it wasn't much fun, but it was, it, you know, looking back, it was just, you know, something that our parents put a lot of work into, yeah. yeah. What's the best part of this shed that is now the library? I think just when, it just reminds your family and then when, you know, when everyone comes home, when, when our two daughters and, and, and our son and, and their family, I, you know, our family and their friends and yeah, just it, that's everyone gets together and can just hang out here and yeah, that's that's what I like about it. Yeah, I think our viewers might be suffering a bit of shed envy after this story. Any advice on how to make a great shed? Uh, I think it's the people around you that you know, make a good shed. It can be a you know behind a shed sitting on a you know twenty litre you know like drum. Everyone's sort of got their like. You know, as long as the beer's cold or whatever it is, it, and, and you got good company. But you know, we had a, a good shed to start with, so we just built from there. And if you reckon your shed is pretty special, why not share it with us on our Facebook page? And that's the show for today. I'll leave you with the weekly weather update from the Bureau. From all the team, bye for now. We'll see you next week. G'day from the Bureau, here's the weekly weather wrap for Sunday the 22nd of October. This weekend a low developed and then intensified near Tasmania and this continues to bring areas of rainfall on Sunday and further strong to damaging wind to Tassie as well as southern parts of Vic and New South Wales. Elsewhere warm and dry weather reign supreme, temperatures of 2 to 10 degrees above the October average in Gulf Western Australia, the Northern Territory, Queensland and Northern New South Wales. Extensive high to extreme fire danger ratings are in place and some areas have total fire bans. While the low in the south moves swiftly away on Monday, there is some interest in the northeast of the map with the potential development of a tropical cyclone. This would be unusual for the time of year as cyclone season has not yet begun, but any storm which does develop is likely to stay far away from Australia. The wind eases for many across the mainland and the fire ratings drop slightly, although it is still warm and dry. A cold front moves across South Australia, Victoria and Tasmania on Tuesday which will bring a few showers and a sharp drop in temperature for the south while also increasing the wind once again across central and parts of northern Australia. On Wednesday, showers with possible hail continue over Tasmania, Victoria and southern SA. Snow could reach as low as 500 metres in Tassie and 800 metres across the mainland. It remains dry everywhere else and windy for many, with another warm day in store for Queensland, northern New South Wales and WA. Cold air spreads much further up the east coast on Thursday, leading to a cooler day with coastal showers for New South Wales and southeast Queensland. Storms are also possible in Queensland. A quickly building high over the bite delivers settled but cool weather for millions more Australians. The week ends with another weak cold front across the south of WA, as well as further showers with possible storms around the New South Wales and southeast Queensland coasts. But it's dry for everyone else. That's all for this week. We will catch you again next time.